we, we, we're in a series called The Blessed Life. How many of you feel like the blessing is, is on your life, that you're walking in the blessing of the Lord? Amen. It's important that you know that the blessing of the Lord is for you. The blessing of the Lord is not reserved for anybody else except for his children. It's really, it's really important that you have this idea and this understanding and this ideology that you are blessed. Not just somewhat blessed, not just a little blessed, but you are blessed. The blessing is for you. And we, we put the word the in front of it because it's not a blessing that everybody has. It's a blessing that is specific, a separated blessing for the child of God. For those that are of the family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all the way through Christ Jesus, the blessing is made available to us. Today, I'm going to just have some fun because I am on assignment again. I feel like I picked up an assignment last week of a different level. I'm excited to be able to address not only your heart and your mind, but to be able to address a spirit in the territory. So if it feels like I go off a little bit, it's not for you. It's not against you, I should say. It is for you, but it's not against you. There's a difference. Unless you feel like this is your spirit, unless you feel like mammon is your, your God, then, then you, may, you may have some trouble with it. But the realization is every once in a while when, you are, when you're called to be a prophetic and apostolic voice, you have to talk past people. Where I'm not actually talking directly to you, I may be speaking to you, but I'm actually talking past you, dealing with something. Jesus did this, my wife referred to it a little bit. Jesus did this when, and she referred to it in prayer actually, I realized that. When Jesus was going to the cross and he declared to his team, I'm going to the cross, and Peter pulled them aside, hey, listen, Lord, you don't need to do that. We're all, on your, we're all on the same side, and he tries to convince them of a better way. Then Jesus spoke past Peter, and he didn't speak. He spoke past him on the behind Peter, and he said, get behind me, Satan. Do you know that there's sometimes something that is addressing you that's not a person? But it's a person, it's, it's an entity and so you need to address it. You need to know when someone's speaking and when someone is being used to speak. And if you, if you don't know, listen, I was a little caught off guard because I didn't know. I, I had never really had a Judas before. But Judas was speaking also on the behalf of this entity and, 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 and was able to corrupt the system because of his position in the system, was able to corrupt it because his voice became a different voice, and he spoke past himself by someone else. And so every once in a while, you need to know that it's not that person, but it's the spirit behind. It's the spirit. It's the, now, can I tell you the spirit behind is not only... Uh, a demonic spirit in the sense that we would see a demonic spirit. Sometimes it's a, the word spirit means the mindset of. It's, the, it's their thought life. These are, these, are, these are thinkers and they're thinking on. And Jesus responded to Peter and says, you, your mind is like a man's mind. And Jesus called that Satan. Your mind is on the things that men's minds are on, and that's satanic. It's inspired by a thought that doesn't come from God. So you need to recognize when someone is speaking something, and it is not a thought that originates from God, it originates from Satan. It does not originate from that person. It originates from a satanic dart, influence, arrow, the Bible calls it a fiery, burning arrow that gets targeted to your brain, gets stuck in there, and it starts to burn that thought. It, 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 it sears a thought into you. The Bible says what, to, it gives us a warning about a seared conscience. That seared conscience comes because fire has touched it. And fire has burned a thought into it that is not going to allow any other thought. Do you know that burned skin, is, it loses its elasticity? Do you know that burned mindsets lose its elasticity, loses its creativity, can't see beyond what they think they know? 
The spirit of mammon wants to burn a thought into you. It wants to limit your ability to think beyond what you can think. It doesn't want you to tap into God's thoughts. Because God's thoughts are higher. Come on, somebody, higher. Can I just speak into this? God's thoughts are higher. God's thoughts are wider. God's thoughts are deeper. God's thoughts are bigger. So the spirit of mammon wants to control and limit your thoughts. The spirit of mammon is not just money itself, but it's the thing, it's one of the things it uses. It, it uses uh, money to control. Someone say to control. And what we're on assignment today is we're, we're on assignment to address this spirit of this territory that has tried to choke out the apostolic and prophetic anointing on your life and on my life and on this church and on this ministry through voices that were like a ventriloquist dummy. But how many of you know that you, when you get old enough, you go, that's not the dummy speaking. Oh, you guys are, are you with me here? That's not the dummy speaking. That's that guy over there. That's that other voice. I don't see his mouth moving, but he's speaking. It, it can start with, with just the way the enemy wants to build identity in you when you're a child. And, and then somehow it's strange how that, 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 that same identity will be revisited when you're an adult, you've grown up. And somehow the enemy will try to sneak that into a conversation. Trying to bring you back into control. Someone say control. It's important that you know the enemy wants to control you. If we just look here, let's go to Genesis chapter 11, verse 1. I want to show you some thoughts again here. Some thoughts on what the spirit of mammon, which we know is the God that was the dedicated God of the Babylonians. We know the Babylonian system was a product of the Tower of Babel or those that were an uh, offshoot of that, that split, the society split, the social split. It's interesting that society still wants to split up into um, seg se segregated things. It's interesting. I've had people, <clears throat> someone, and many other people. I, have one, I remember when we were in Rainer Valley, presence of God is there. The word is being preached, and it's all excited, and they're happy about it. Lady comes up, and, you know, she's used to a certain kind of church. Uh, she had a big old hat on, and she's used to a certain kind of church. And she says, you know, I really love the anointing here, but I can't get with it. I said, why? And she said, because there's so many different colors. I'm used to one. How many of you know that's a spirit of mammon? That's a separating spirit. It's, it's, it's you then begin to gather around what, what, what you relate to. Because what you relate to is easy. And you don't have to work through any emotions to relate with someone else. You don't have to work past their, their quirks and their pains and their, their, their upbringing and where they live versus where you live. It's easy to gather with people that are just like you. It's, it's, more, uh, it's, it's more challenge. You have to really know that you're a blessed person to gather with people that are not like you. You have to know that there's something unique about you to be a church where you can gather, especially as well over here in this territory that have so many faces, so many ethnic backgrounds, so many kinds of skin colors, and so many kinds of, uh, 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 of, of, of uh, economic backgrounds in one room. I had someone say to me, I, when I walked into your church, I, I was trying to find people that look like me. Because that's the mindset, people that look like you. The realization is maybe you don't need someone that looks like you because they also think like you. Maybe you need someone that doesn't look like you because they don't think like you. And when they don't think like you, they may be able to challenge you in a few areas. They may be able to help you expand yourself because if all you're doing is looking for someone that looks like you, you just want to love you. That tells me that you have a spirit of mammon because you're so in love with you.
Because it makes it hard to love other people when you love you. In Genesis chapter 11, verse 1, it says this. Let's read it together. Now the whole earth, now the whole earth had one language and one mind. Now listen, we were, they were speaking the same word, but one, one, one language is, is not enough. You have to have the same mind. They have the same speech. Speech represents more than just what you're saying. It's more than just air pushing against air and forming words. Speech talks about what, where it comes from, the internal mindset. There is one, one mind and there is one language in the earth at this time. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. Now look at this. I want you to see this verse 3. We're going to go into the verse 3. It says, and they said to one another. See this? And they said to one another, come let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had they had brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. Now look at verse 4. And they said, come, let us build. Say build. It's interesting because this whole story is about building. It's about building something. It's about building. So when I was praying for this week, because I had another sermon scheduled, I have to throw this one in. This, was, this one came somewhere later in the week. But, but I had another one planned in my series plan, and, and the Lord said, I want you to talk about the constructs of life. The constructs of life. It's important that you know that every God and the spirit of mammon want to control the constructs of life. He wants to control what life is built upon, what you use to build your life what you use to build relationships. If you want something meaningful in life, it must be built. Nothing meaningful happens accidentally. So he's using this term, bricks, which is strange because it shows you in this, this statement, they're in the same language, the same mind, and they start using bricks. Someone say same language, same mind, they start using bricks. And now what this is telling you is telling you that everybody starts to have a shape that is formed, they're formed by. Now, a brick is, is unnatural. It's one of the most unnatural things you can find. You can't find a brick in nature. You have to actually go where someone is forming bricks. Do you know every time you find bricks, asphalt, in the Bible, it's actually, it actually relates to their captivity? Every time, it's always talking about captivity. It's always talking about someone controlling. We know that Nimrod was in control of this tower building. And what he did is he broke people's uniqueness. He broke their individuality. See, do you know the only way that you can get bricks is by breaking up the stone to gravel? You have to take something that is a natural building material, break it down. Can I tell you what the enemy's been trying to do in your life? He's been trying to break you down so he can form you the way he wants to. The spirit of mammon tries to break you, break your talent, break your ability, break your gifting, break you to the point that you're little pieces and then he can reform you the way he wants to. And when you reform the way he wants to and he keeps working that, then it's a brick by brick. Do you know what's really important about having bricks? Bricks allows you to build in a way that is formed by your thought process. But do you know if you have stone, you have to stop and look at each piece? You have to look at each. When God wants to build with you, he has to look at you, and then he has to look at the piece next to you, and he has to look at the piece next to you, and he has to take into account every little nook, cranny, skill of each one of you and say, you too, you may not look alike, but I can see how I can work you two together. But if I break you, and I, and I break you down, and I can make you to whatever I want to, I don't need to think about you anymore. See, brick always represents your building for me. If you go somewhere and you find that everybody looks the same, there's a Nimrod there. All right. All right, you guys getting quiet on me. If you go somewhere, everybody looks the same, walks the same, talks the same, there's a Nimrod there. 
and that Nimrod is breaking down everyone else's identity for the sake of serving him. But if you really, really want to tap into what God is doing, you have to look at each individual. Go, I see this in you. This is going to fit well here. We're going to have to maneuver over a couple of other rocks here. So I'm just, I'm just telling you, this is about building. Someone say building. Now, if you understand that, that the, the building constructs of God has to do with four areas of your life. Four areas of your life that God wants to construct and four areas of your life that mammon wants to construct. And the four areas are this. Family. Someone say family. Friendships. Your friends. Your faith. And your finance. The four things that, mo that, that Abraham focused on was family, friends, faith, and finance. Now, if you, if, you, if you think like me, then you're going to ask yourself this question. It's, it's strange that in Genesis 11, you see that this breakdown is happening and this mammon is being reintroduced and Babylon is being introduced. But in Genesis 12, God is calling Abraham on the scene. He is now setting the antidote for Genesis 11 in Genesis 12. And he declares, he says, anyone who is on your team is blessed. And anyone who does not decide to work with you is cursed. Now, this is important that you see this because the blessing is when people work with you. When they work against you is when they are, when they are fighting. And now, the curse literally means that God won't work for them because God's working for you. God works against. I want you to see this because it's important that you know this word construct. Someone say construct. Construct is this, to lay, to dispose, to set in order, to construct, to put together parts of a thing in their proper place, order, to build, to form, to construction, the con to devise, to compose. I want you to know that God wants you to purposely construct your family. Purposely construct your friendships. Purposely construct your faith and purposely construct your finances. And if the enemy's going to use anything, he's going to try to affect those four areas. Someone say, family. This is going to be important. I know it is. I know at the end. I, I found it very important. But he wants, he wants something because if a covenant relationship is going to break, it's going to break in family, friends, faith, or finance. If you want to protect your life, protect those four areas because your life is constructed in those areas. Everything that your life consists of is those areas. Everything that the enemy wants to influence is those areas. If the spirit of mammon wants to influence something, he's going to come to those areas. So you need to construct intentionally in those areas. If you're not intentional in any other areas, but you need to be intentional in those four areas. Family, friendships, faith. In finance. Abraham made covenant with God. Covenant is the enemy of mammon. Now think about this. This is, we're talking about just, we're still laying foundation. Genesis chapter 12 is the antidote to Genesis chapter 11. Where things are being separated and broken. He comes and he puts together a man and teaches him how to bring things together. This anointing is now in, it's called the blessing. This anointing is now in Christ Jesus according to Galatians. Right? The blessing. Now get this. That means I'm anointed to have covenant relationships in family. I'm, I'm anointed to have covenant relationships and friendships. I'm anointed to have covenant relationships with my faith. I'm anointed to have covenant relationships with my finances. That if he's going to try to attack anything, he's coming after covenants. Covenant relationships. I remember sharing with, with someone, the, I feel like the Lord is calling us to be a church that focuses on training business leaders. I remember sharing this. I said, I feel like there's, a, there's, there's something that's going to be premier about our training. The way we train people. 
And, and, I, and, I, and I went back to that date that I shared that, and then I followed up the track of experience that I experienced after that, and it started the day that I made that announcement. And in that same voice, I made that announcement that it's going to take covenant relationships to do it. If you go back to every relationship that's been under attack or that is under attack in your life, it starts with a covenant. It starts with a covenant. God only endorses covenants based upon the four, the four areas. So the Bible wants us to make relationships. Some say make them. Make, build these relationships. Use the construction material that you are to build a relationship. Build these relationships because the enemy in this territory wants to break relationships. There is a spirit of offense that is released in this territory because offense breaks relationships. Offense breaks covenant connections. I can talk to you, I can do an interview here, and I would find out that every one of us have had relationships challenged or covenants broken in family, friendships, faith, and finance. And you have to know what that is. Now, as we move on, let's go to Luke 16. Luke 16, verse 9. I'm going to ask you guys to step it up. And I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon. Now, this is an interesting, I've, I've dwelt on this for a long time. This is a big verse for me. Now, make, make friends. Someone say make. Make friends for yourself. Now, this is important that you know the construction of friendship is that word make. That word make literally means to construct friendships by using unrighteous mammon. Using what the mammon, the God of mammon would use, he would use money to influence every relationship. He would use money. But the Bible is saying here, do, do the same. Use money to build relationships. It also means build relationships around money. See, the enemy wants to divide relationships around money. But God wants to use money to build relationships. Don't get, don't get quiet here. This is not the time. This is the time you go, yeah, I got it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get this. I'm going to live in this. And I remember when the Lord first started to in, in, inspire me to this thought. When I was young, when I was uh, in high school, I, we, you know, we would hang around, you know, different friends. And one of the friends' uh, fathers was really wealthy. And he invited us to go to the Columbia Tower and have, have dinner there. That was the first time I ever had ice cream in between. They actually give you sherbet in between. And I was like, oh, this is great. They give you sherbet after the appetizer. And I was like, this is awesome. I'm getting sherbet now and I get cake later? I had no idea. And I had more silverware than I'd ever seen in my whole life. And I was sitting up there, and I remember they were telling us how expensive it is and how, how, how separate this club is and how, how you can't get to this club without a membership, and the membership costs this much. And, and, and I, re, I remember asking, what was this sherbet? Why did you give us sherbet now? And he says, oh, this is the palate cleaner. It's supposed to remove the flavor of what was there before to set you up for what's coming. And I remember thinking, I don't get that at Denny's. I don't get that. I mean, how many of you know if you don't get that? I've not had that at Ruth Chris. And I remember thinking, I want to be a member there. This was when I was young. Then, then when I started to study this scripture, the Holy Spirit spoke to me as I read this, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon. He says, there's Trace, he says, Tracy, there's certain people I need you to get to, but you can't get to them because you can't afford it. He says, there's certain people I want you to reach, but you can't reach them because you can't afford to get in. He says, I want to be able to send you to sit next to someone in the Columbia Tower. This is what he spoke to me. He says, but you can't afford it. So I have to now give you unrighteous mammon so that you can make friendships there. 
You guys got, I need at least three people right up here to say that's me. So you have to understand that there are some friends you won't make until you have unrighteous mammon. Because their life is surrounded by mammon. Their life is mammon. Everything they want is mammon. Everything they do is mammon. They serve the God of mammon. And God wants to set you up to be in the midst to be an evangelist where people are not welcome. I, I need to be in a position where my kind is not welcome. God wants to set you up, but he's going to use the access pass called unrighteous mammon to get you there. I've had politicians spend extra time talking to me because they think I have unrighteous mammon. They wouldn't have given me any time if they didn't think I was going to give to them. But because they expected me to write a check for what they were into, and they expected me to use my influence to convince other people to write checks, they now give me the time that I couldn't get if I didn't have money. Can I tell you, you need to use money as a tool. What other people use unrighteously, you need to use it righteously. When you use it righteously, you break the back of mammon. You break the power of the God that controls lives through mammon. You need to know that you need to build relationships based upon that idea. Man, I'm going to preach this more because I just feel like there's resistance and I'm not going to tolerate it because I'm on assignment. Oh, I forgot. I told you. I'm speaking past you. Because I know I'm breaking mindsets because money, sex, those things are not allowed to be talked about in church. But I'm talking about it. Well, not sex yet, but one these days will do. Because Christians act like they don't want either of them. I'm glad someone said we do. It's like, my goodness. Christians act like, ooh, sex and money, ooh, my goodness. I'm going to heaven, Lord, Ebenezer, take me now, Jesus. I'm just going to address the evil spirit that makes you live in falseness, that makes you live like a brick that's tried to mold you and form you into something and says you either belong here or you don't belong here. Your brick days are over. Your brick days are over. Your days are being formed. I've had people, now listen, they said, if you come here, you've got to be like this. I said, well, I'm not like that. I'm loud. I sweat when I preach. I like loud worship. And I like jumping in worship. Now, if you can't handle that, I'm a stone, a living stone, not a brick. I'm going to change. I'm going to keep on forming. I'm not going to be formed to your thing. Well, you're not going to grow a church, but I'll address a devil every week, and I'll address an evil spirit that's trying to form me and make me a brick. I will not be your brick. I address that Nimrod spirit because we are not to be bricks. We're supposed to be living stones. Stones that God wants to use to build this temple. God wants to use the way you are to build his temple, not to form you like me. But we can have the mind of Christ and we can be formed in his language and we can still be ourselves and have Jesus. You will not be a brick and you will get to places only bricks can go. You'll be that one living stone in the midst of bricks. I want you to know and understand that it's, it's okay to be what you carry, your gifting, because God wants to use you to touch and build friendships based upon this unrighteous thing. The word unrighteous means it's used unjustly. It doesn't mean it's wrong. It just means it's used improperly. And he wants you to use it properly. The word unjust doesn't mean it's evil. It means it's used wrongly. Mammon is controlled by the spirit of mammon, and he wants you to use it wrongly. Most of the time, it's used to control somebody. 
But what if we are using it to release people? Come on, to set people free, to set our families free, to set our friends free, to have more faith in the earth and have more glory in the earth that God can manifest himself. What if we use it properly? That's what we build relationships on. You want to do it? Let's do it together. We're going to build a plan to get this unrighteous mammon that will use it properly. We'll use it to build lives. We'll use it to build children. We'll use it to turn lives around. We'll use it to make family work. We'll use it properly. We'll take it from its improper use. You and I have the power of converting what is unrighteous to righteous. Jesus did it. Why avoid what you have the power to to make righteous again? We are called to make it. I just love the idea, this, this, this idea, because relationships always, you have to have something. Relationships will always have to do with your economic state every single time. I know you want, don't want to accept it. That's okay. We're breaking, we're breaking your brick. But the realization is every relationship has financial implications. You hang around with people who pull you down, it will affect your finances. You hang around with people who lift you up, it will affect your finances. Your friendships determine your economic status. The young rich ruler said, I want to come with you, Jesus. I want to be on your side. I want to live for you. I want to, I want to go this next level with you. Can I, can I come with you? And Jesus said, hey, come with me. Listen, you'll be, Jesus was looking for a 12th apostle. He's looking for another one. He was a replaced Judas. He wasn't just coming to be a disciple. He said, come and follow me. He'd only said that to 12. Come and follow me. He lost one. Now he's saying, he's, he's going to lose one. Now he says, come and follow me. Come and follow me. He didn't say that to everybody else. Everyone else just started following him. So when he says, come and follow me, he brings him at a platform that is apostolic. Come and follow me. Be a part of my leadership team. This young rich ruler has an opportunity in front of him. I've been asking this question, how come people in this generation don't recognize opportunities? Opportunities right in front of them. And I realize it's the blind spirit of mammon. Because mammon, we talked about last week, manifests in two ways, pride and poverty. Pride says, I don't need this opportunity. Poverty says, it's too hard, I'll get it another way. Okay, now listen, listen, listen. Don't miss your opportunity even right now to say amen. Amen. I want you to see this. This young man, he walks away and he says, Jesus says, you, you've, he says, all the, do these commandments. And the young man says, I've done all these commandments. I've done them all. I'm there. I'm with you. He says, but this one thing. Someone say one thing. This one thing you lack. He says, I want you to learn to do this. I want you to learn to buy a relationship right now. I want you to be generous with what you have. Let it all go so that you can learn to walk with me because I am generous. He was telling him, not just get rid of stuff, but he says, if you're going to walk with me, you need my speech and my language. If you don't have my speech and my language, you won't stay with me very long. And the way that you get my speech and language is the way that I got here is I let go of everything to come here. Come on, church. I let go of everything. Jesus let go of everything. He walked away from all of his rich, all of his fame, everything to come here. And he says, you want to come with me? You want to literally walk with me at this level? Let go of everything. Doesn't mean you won't get it back, but I need to know that you have the same language and the same speech. That you walk at the same level of generosity that I walk in. And what he was asking this young man to do is to let go of everything for relationship with me. And he couldn't do it. And he turns to his disciples, he says, little children, pay attention to this, how hard it is for a person who trusts in their riches 
Not just for a rich person, but a person who trusts in their mammon, their money. How hard it is for a person who trusts in money to get into heaven, the kingdom of heaven. Not going to heaven, but to get into the kingdom. Kingdom is talking about authority. It's just amazing. I know people who trust in their money and they want authority of true riches to be able to cast out devils and heal the sick. But they don't have true riches because they trust in their money. But when you know that money is used for simply a tool to build relationships. Money is not for any other reason. It's to build relationships. And this young man had a chance to build a relationship with, ev- with a person that everybody should have wanted to have a relationship with. All he had to do is let go of some money. He chose to keep the relationship with mammon. The Bible says that a man's gift, someone say gift, will make room for them and bring them. Someone say bring them. I just, I just want you to know God wants, to, wants your gift to bring you somewhere. And it says it in the translation, New Living, it says bring you before important people. That's a relationship. How come my gift is going to bring me before a relationship? Let's look at the scripture here. In verse, in Luke 6, I, we need to read this together, if you don't mind. We need to read it together, 36, at least Luke 6, 36. So how many of you know there's, there's ways to break a relationship? How many know there's destructive ways to relationships? If we can put up that, there we go. Look, 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 at, look at some destructive ways to, dis, ways to destroy a relationship. Judge. Judgment is a horrible relationship construct. It's, 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 it's awful to be in a relationship where people are judging you. You guys ever, ever experienced that? Every time you walk in, you feel uncomfortable. You don't feel like you can be yourself. You don't feel like you can be at ease because you feel the eye is judging you. That is not a relationship building. You know that they're, they're judging. That's not, judge, that's not a good relationship builder. You can't have a solid family on judgment. You can't have good friendships on judgment. Can you have good, good faith on judgment? I mean, that's, that's what people feel condemned. They feel like God's constantly judging them. Yeah. Finances on judgment. Judgment doesn't build. Judgment destroys. Judgment breaks down. I'm just talking to you right now. The next thing it says, it says, it says judge not and you should not be judged. It's important that you know this scripture is saying if you judge, you're reaping judgment. If you sow judgment, judgment is going to come back to you. Isn't that a giving principle? That's a giving principle. Then he goes on, he says, condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. So we see it, condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. That is important that you know that is a principle of giving. You have to be generous not to be a judging. I feel like doing a mic drop. You have to be generous not to be a judgmental person. You have to be able to look past what people are doing that get on your nerves. You have to be, you have to be a generous person not to be a condemning person. Now, see, a judgmental person thinks everybody should look like this. A condemning person thinks everybody looks like this. Well, you know, if they look like this or they did this and they did this. I spent years in Bellevue, people trying to make me this. In the congregation, after every service. Pulled me off to the side. My wife off to the side. If you stop saying it this way, we'll invite more people. If you would, if you would not be so loud and so quiet, we would invite more people. 
If you wouldn't say it so harshly and so strong, we would invite more people. Well, you know, we came with more money. I'm not going to be your brick. When I get to heaven, I need to look like a living stone. If I walk into heaven trying to look like a brick, he won't know where to put me. He has to crush me. He has to break me. He has to, he has to destroy that form because that form is not how he made me. I know it's not what your friends will accept, but do they need the Holy Ghost? Do they need the presence of the Lord? Do they need convicting words so that they stop abusing their medicine cabinet? See, you can have everybody look the same or you can be free. I, I give notice to this demonic spirit in this territory. I will not be a brick. I will not be a brick. You will not be a brick. The constructs of life for you is God wants to give you a living stone life, a life that is constantly growing, a life that is constantly molding. Your shape is changing every day. Your shape is constantly changing. And only God himself knows where to put you when you're growing the way you grow. I love I love this about church. You know why Pastor Phil is my pastor? We've been for 20 plus years. It's because I realize God puts you in relationships. You don't choose them. It's many of you think you're coming to this church because you chose it. You were put here. You better realize that. You are on assignment here, put here. Put here. And it's the people who who some bricks here that can't hang here. You have to realize when you are part of an apostolic work, you are not just a part of a regular church. You're part of a church where God is trying to form you. I remember saying in that same sitting at the table going, listen, men, I have a dream. That God is, I sound like Martin Luther King. I have a dream that God gave me. That God said, raise up a thousand millionaires. Um, one of the men looked at me and goes, well, that's a lofty dream. I wish I had a brick. How dare you spit on someone's dream? You know what that, you know what, you know what that's, don't take, you, 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 cannot, you cannot kill someone's dream. I said, the Lord told me to raise up a thousand millionaires. And what we would do is we'd come together in a conference room and we would pray and we would seek God and make these, billion, these businessmen look like ministers and ministers look like businessmen. And we would pray and seek God. And as we sought God, God would drop a nation in our hearts, and we would get on the phone working that nation, and we'd say, we're coming in, we're going to be there for this many days, we're going to meet with the government, we're going to meet with education, we're going to meet with business leaders, we're going to meet with everybody that we need to in the day, and in the evening, we're going to have miracle crusades, and we're on our way, and we have a fleet of jets, and we're ready to go. I start sharing that. As soon as I shared that, Mammon said, not here. And those of you that are still here, welcome to the Living Stone Club. Because I have a dream. <laughs> the Lord said, as soon as you get off the planes in that country, he says, I'll tell you to go, and you must be able to go. Fuel the jets and go. And when you get off of the plane, just reach down, grab whatever dust you can in your hands, let it move through your hands, and I'll give you revelation of how to turn that nation around. <laughs> Kathleen, you were in the service when the Lord first gave me that revelation in Black Diamond. In the 90s. And I've been dreaming this. I've been dreaming this. Yeah. 
just dreaming this. What is it going to take for us to change nations? Nations are laughing at us. And where their help is because they see bricks. People who are formed trying to fit in. We're not called to fit in. We're called to construct. I don't know, who's, I don't know who, the, who they are, but I realized, I looked in that, I said, man, I, I, you may not believe. You are the one that I thought would believe the most. And you don't believe. You're the one I'm leaning on to believe. And you don't believe. Care where you start. I realize my thing is I like to take people who are dirt and let's raise them up. I like to take people who don't have and let's build them. Because we are the construction of the Lord. God's building something. I want this spirit of mammon to be removed. And we can't build judging each other. We can't build condemning each other. We must use forgiveness to build. We must use forgiveness to build. Forgiveness is a building material. Giving is a building material. Two that contradict judging and condemnation. Forgiving and giving. We must walk in forgiveness. That's the building material of the kingdom of God. That's the level of generosity that you can tap in. If you can tap in the forgiveness... Each one of these things are giving. When you refuse to judge, you're giving. When you refuse to condemn, you're giving. When you forgive, you're giving. Then it says here, give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more running over, poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. The goal of the Lord is that we as people, not that we would be giving for the sake of receiving. But when you give, you can't help but receive because God will not allow you to be better than him. People say you can't outgive God. Why? Because he won't allow you to be better than him. You give to God, he will always supersede what you give. And he'll compare your giving and say, I've got to do better than them. That's why he says, it will be measured, pressed down, shaken together, running over. As you give, the amount you give will determine him coming back and being better. The spirit of mammon doesn't want you to be a giver. It doesn't want you to be generous. Because pride is not a giver. And poverty is not a giver. Someone say pride is not a giver. Poverty is not a giver. The mindset that belittles what you have and belittles who you are, that poverty never has enough to give. It never wants to see past themselves. Pride never sees past themselves. Those are the two most selfish heart conditions, pride and poverty. Pride sees himself, poverty sees himself. I would love to give, but I don't have enough for myself. That's selfish to be broke. It's selfish to be poor and poor in your mind where you don't think you can give. In Israel, you're a beggar, you still have to pay tithe. In Israel, you still have the commandment, the misfrost to give if you're broke. Sorry, I'm, I'm doing all right. I want you to see this. Giving is a hard issue based upon the judge not, condemn not. Forgive, give. Giving is a hard issue, which means it's a relationship issue. Are you guys learning? We need to break the spirit of mammon by being more generous. 
more generous than ever. Not generous to where I walk across the stage and you know what I've given. Because that's pride. If I'm now, if you give and I'll treat you differently, that's pride. That's my poverty and your pride. See, there's a lot of people that want to be known as the generosity club. Because they want to be known that they are the givers of the church. And when you do that, you have now given into mammon. When people know that you gave a certain amount of money, now you are a slave to mammon. And you set yourself to be better than everybody else. And now everybody else wants to mold themselves to be like you so that they all too also can get identified like you. But what about not letting your left hand know, not letting your right hand know? When we made generosity a popularity thing, we destroyed the spirit of it. Oh, come on, church. It is just as much mammon to give in front of people. Wow. Say, I'm gifted. Your gift is going to bring you before. Romans 12, let's look at this, verse 8. If your gift is encouraging others, what does the next verse say? What does the next part of say? If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. That means I can have the gift of encouragement and not be encouraging. See, the, that, that B is empowering me to be it, not making me be it. You can be gifted with something and not actually function in it. Look what the next verse says. If your gift, if, if, if your gift is giving, give generously. If your gift is giving... Give. Now, this is how you are. If you are a giver, then don't do it sparingly. If you're, now, I want you to see this because this now takes it to a spiritual place. If my gift is giving, that means the Holy Spirit wants to empower me to be gifted giver. You know how I received the gift of healing? I, I asked for it. You know how I received the gift of prophecy? I was revealed that I had it. I hungered for healing. Didn't hunger for prophecy because it was, it was easy. But my, I wanted so badly to operate in healing. I hated sickness. Sometimes your gift is active because you hate something. There's gifts you're born with, and there's gifts that you activate just because you can't stand something. You guys, I, I, I believe that if you don't like poverty and you don't like pride, that you can activate something. One of the gentlemen I coached, he's a top Mercedes-Benz salesman in the United States. He's out of Irvine. And uh, I asked him, what is your motivation? Because he was having a hard time at home. I coached him in one of the four constructs. He was okay with finances. He was good with his faith. But his family was suffering. His friends were great. See, we, want, we may have three of the four, but it sabotages 
So he would go home, and he wouldn't have any excitement at home. There would be no energy at home. And I just simply talked to him about how are you at work. And then we do the coaching of what's at work. And then we talked to him about how to translate that work, building friends, influencing people at work. How come you can't do that with your child or your wife? There's no difference. You just choose the environment you think it works in. So I started working on that fourth construct, that one of those fourth constructs, which was family. And I said, what, what is the, why are you so motivated to make money? Christian man. He said, well, I, um, I grew up in the Bronx. I grew up in New York. I, I hate poverty. I hate it. So I said, the reason you make so much money and you work so hard at work is you hate poverty. You hate not having money. But I said, the problem is you associate poverty to only money and not to poverty to relationships. You're impoverished at home. You are broke at home. That's all I needed to tell him. You just as broke at home as you were in the Bronx. Your relationships are broke. Now, people, people say, that's so mean. Do you know that guy turned it around? See, I realize I, I talk to you guys as if I'm coaching you, and people are like, you just, I'm like, you just. <laughs> and he turned around, and he received the same gift to be generous at home that he had to be generous because his hatred for poverty gave him the gift of giving. And he took that gift that he was using to give at work, and he used that gift at home and turned his family around. Because if you are gifted, then be. Do you, can we put that up there for a second? Because if you're gifted, then be. Don't act, but be. Don't pretend, but be. This is the reason Jesus was telling the rich young ruler, get rid of everything because you are acting like you're one way, but let's be it. See, when you're acting a certain way, it's in your head, but when you are it, it's in your heart. If your gift is encouraging, be. Everywhere you go, everything you do, everybody you talk to, it's just encouraging. I can't help it. I'm just so encouraging. Why? Because I be it. Do you know if you're not encouraging yourself, you can't be it? The next is if, if you uh, just, <laughs> if you have the gift of giving, then be. Do it with absolute crazy generosity. Be it. Be generosity. Don't like I'm going to work on being. Just be it. How do you do that? First, stop judging yourself. Stop condemning yourself. Forgive yourself. The people who really break down relationships are the people who don't like themselves. Judgmental people are judging themselves more than they're judging you. Condemning people are condemning themselves more. Than, so they're not it, but they be condemning or they be condemned so they are condemning. They be judged so they are judging. But if you be generous, then you are generous. If you be a leader, if God has given you, then it says, leadership. If God has given you leadership abilities, take the responsibility serious. Be a leader. If you have a gift of showing kindness, do it. Come on. person's not kind. They can't give you what they're not. It's poverty. It's mammon. 
You may be called to do something, but your life, your lifestyle or your upbringing in one of the, the four, what I'm calling four fabulous, one of those four things are not working well in your lives. Family, friends, faith, finance. The enemy wants those. He wants them. He wants those areas. God wants those areas. Those areas make the whole world go around. You lose those areas, one of those areas, they sabotage the other three. You lose your faith. It sabotages your finance, your family. You lose your finances, it, it sabotages everything. If we can really construct those areas on purpose, intentionally. You know what I love? That God says in contradiction to Babel, he says, Abraham, be blessed. The blessing is on you. And you're going to be a blessing. The goal wasn't just for him to be blessed, but the goal was for him to be a blessing. Man, if we walk into our families every day, we walk into our homes every day, I'm going to be a blessing to my family today. Oh, do you know what would happen if you just wake up and you know, I'm going to be a blessing to you today. I'm going to be a blessing to you today. Kenneth Copeland tells a story that he was asleep on the couch and one his wife just comes and I think she, something happened. She had accidentally woke him up or it needed to wake him up. And all of a sudden he gets up and he's just yelling at her and he's just mad at her because he says he had an anger problem. He's just going off on her. And all of a sudden she just looks at him and he says she's never argued back, but she just looks at him and says, Kenneth, I'm just trying to be a blessing to you. That melted everything down. Everything disappeared at that point. And he stopped being that way. Her being a blessing to him broke anger off of him. Destroyed anger. I'm just trying to be a blessing to you. Do you know the Abrahamic blessing is that we just go around and we're to be a blessing? Oh, well, there's only two of us in the house. That, that's great because you both wake up and you go, I'm going to be a blessing to you. Do you know what the house would look like if you both just working, being a blessing on each other? Your friends. Someone says, well, why should I build friendships? Can I tell you, friendships are not about what you receive, but it's much more about how you can be generous to them. How can you construct in their life? Faith. The blessing of the Lord. I, I want to keep my faith. Time. I want to keep my faith. I want to keep my faith, church. Every day there's something trying to steal your faith. A problem taking too long or something that you're hoping for or something, and you get to look at the realities while you're hoping for something. Something's trying to steal your faith. But I want to keep my faith until he comes because he says one thing I'm coming looking for. I'm looking to find faith in the earth. And if I'm the only one there, I want to be just waiting, seeing him come out of the clouds with my heart beating with faith. I'm still hoping. What if it never comes? Could you still be there on the day that he parts the clouds, still hoping? I've been waiting for so long. What if it never comes? I'm going to keep my faith. Because if I lose my faith, I disappoint him. I would much rather be disappointed than him be disappointed. I'm going to keep my faith. Is there anyone with me? You're going to keep your faith. I'm not going to let it be shipwrecked. I'm not going to let it go. I'm not going to let go of my faith. I'm not going to stop believing. I don't understand everything. I don't know why things don't work the way that I prayed or I wanted. I don't know why, but I know what. I'm going to keep my faith because he's God, and I'm not. And he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I don't know why it takes so long. And I don't know why it doesn't happen immediately. And I don't know why things happen. And I don't know why bricks are made. But I know this. I'm going to keep my faith. I'm going to keep my faith. He wants is the one thing he wants is when he comes back, he wants to find faith in the earth. And I want to give it to him. 
Your present when you walk in the heaven is your faith. Have it. It will be exchanged for the crown. Walk in with your faith. Keep it. Fight for it. I'm going to use generosity. I'm going to use it. I'm going to use money. I'm going to use it. And I'm going to make some friends. <laughs> Amen. I'm going to build some relationships. Because the relationships, if you follow that down, it says, and these will welcome you in eternity. These relationships are going to last forever. You and I building together, taking down mammon, that's going to last forever. We're going to walk in going, we did it, bro. We kicked that mammon in the face. He got a good one on me, but I'm, I, I don't like it, so I hit back. Is there anyone ready to hit back harder? Anybody ready to hit back harder? Amen. I know I've been preaching long, hallelujah, three weeks in a row. But I'm on assignment. I wish I could let you go earlier. <laughs> I'm on assignment. And I have to preach past you for a little bit here. Because I need to address an evil spirit that slapped me and hit me and hurt me. It did hit me and it hurt me. It did hit me and it hurt me. But I'm, I'm going to hit back harder. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. That we are your living stones. Come on, just become a living stone. Shabbat him, We are your living stones, God. Come on, just cry out. Just come on, declare your peace, declare your faith, declare your hope, declare your generosity, declare your blessing to your family and your friends, declare whatever. Just receive right now the goodness of the Lord. I want you to retain your faith today. If you're here today and you feel like something's been trying to steal your faith, I want to pray for you. Just lift your hand. If something's been trying to work on your faith, just lift your hand. I want to know if this is communicating to anyone. I speak to you right now in the name of Jesus. I speak to your heart. Be full of faith. Be full of courage. Be bold. Be courageous. In the name of Jesus, I take authority over everything that's trying to come against you. And I release faith in you. I release strength to you. I say be bold in the name of Jesus. Father, we stand and we're going to believe again. We're going to believe again. We're going to hope again. We stand against the spirit of mammon. We stand against pride and we stand against poverty. We break it. We stand against condemnation and we stand against judgment. And we break its power in the name of Jesus. I command it to break from our families. To break from our families, to break from our friendships, to break from our faith, to break from our finances. We break its power in the name of Jesus. We break its power. We break the spirit of control. We cast you off of our lives. We take authority over you and we command you to loose us and to let us go. And we celebrate the victory. We thank you, Father, for your goodness. In Jesus' name. Come on, let's give the Lord a big clap and a shout today. As you're praising the Lord, our prayer team's coming forward. Our prayer team's coming forward. And if you need prayer for anything, I want to encourage you to come and receive prayer. If you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I'm encouraging you to come and one of our prayer team members they will pray with you they are all anointed they're all ready to pray they're all gifted with generosity they're all ready to give life and strength and zoe life in you whatever circumstances you have in life i release to you the goodness of the lord be blessed today be strong as before you leave just come and receive any kind of prayer or touch if you need that amen have a wonderful day happy memorial weekend continue to believe and remember that jesus is lord and he is savior and he died for each and every one of us so let's remember that this weekend. Amen. God bless.